Good morning, good afternoon, or I guess good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, Randy and I are excited to be here. We've got some interesting stuff to, to share with you today. Uh, in keeping with the nature of this track uh, being a case study, we're going to try to spend a little bit less time on, on slides and a little bit more time doing some live demos. It's always risky, but we're going we're gonna to take a, a chance here and, and hopefully show you some cool stuff that'll help you with your open source program office. Um, real quick, let's Let's, let's run through a few things. Um, just some introductions. Myself, um, I've been working in this open source program office field for, for the better part of 10 years. Um, although, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, this field has evolved quite a bit. Um, I am an attorney. That's how I got involved in it from the governance side. Um, Randy is much more technical than I. You know, he's, he's helped us with a lot of the, the uh, tooling and so forth that we developed. Um, but uh, we, we started the open source program office a couple of years ago and it, we, we've made a pretty good start and we're proud of some of the things we've done. Uh, Randy, go ahead. Hi, I'm an engineer uh, here at Optum. I achieved the illustrious title of distinguished engineer. Um, I've been in software engineering and test systems engineering uh, for over 30 years. And I think um, what I, one thing that that has contributed to my, to the makeup of my personality is that I am frugal. And uh, so I kind of started really digging into open source probably 20 years ago, thinking it was uh, going to be very useful both in my home life and in, in the work life. And in the last 10 years, it's it's become more and more accepted. My participation in this project has been um, around infrastructure as code. Expert might be a little bit of a strong, but I'm, I'm getting pretty good at it. Um, and I've been in the healthcare and manufacturing domains in my career. Uh, I, I worked for a, uh, another large company that had manufacturing plants, and I think bringing some of that skill set and uh, the learnings from how to streamline operations really helped me understand inf uh, information technology better. All right. Thanks, Randy. Um, just real quick, a quick disclaimer. Randy and I are speaking for ourselves. These are our opinions. Um, a lot of the things that I might talk about might touch on uh, legal topics. Please don't take that as legal advice. And as always, please check with your own professional legal counsel for any particular issues you might have. Real quick, one of the things that you need to understand to, to see the perspective, to see where we're coming from as we've tried to implement these tools to run our open source program office is that we're dealing with extremely large volumes. Um, so anytime we go to implement tools or look at vendors, uh, we always have to consider size and, and can they handle the volume? And are we gonna make an investment that we can't get away from five years later? So this slide is just something to throw up there to give you a feel for the kind of, of sizing that we have to deal with. We're talking about 28,000 plus engineers. We're talking last glance over 8,000 individual applications most of which are only used internal to our organization. So that also sort of colors our opinion, although we do do some um, commercial products and services. Um, they almost all used open source. We're in 140 countries around the world. Um, our technology organization as a whole, um, again, we're a public company, so th these numbers are, are all public. Uh, you know, we invest over $3.6 billion in technology um, annually. annually. Right, and um, again, we, we, we've got lots of people, over 325,000 people across all groups within Optum. So everything we do, we have to worry about size. Go ahead, Randy. Oh, what we do here uh, at this company is our, our mission statement is dual, uh, helping people live healthier lives, and which I always have to be reminded, making the health system work better for everyone. We're trying to quote unquote, uh, fix the health system. Um, we have uh, business units that are separated into two basic operating entities. One is United Healthcare, that is, a, we provide benefits uh, or, or insurance administration. So, just, you know, we provide health insurance for people. And we process claims and we manage networks of doctors and we negotiate discounts. And it's kind of classic insurance for both self funded and uh, also we, we will fund or take the risk as well. Uh, in that operation, uh, we generate mountains of data, which is extremely useful for other types of health services and for research. Uh, so we have this other business called Optum Health Services, and that is um, kind of a kitchen sink of many different operating entities. 
that cover uh, everything else in the health system besides the insurance. And uh, so things we do are like nurse chat lines um, or we'll send nurses into people's homes with house calls. We've recently just uh, made the move into primary care. So we've been acquiring and growing uh, basically doctor's offices and clinics around the country. We're not really big into hospitals yet, but we seem to get into everything. We have the largest behavioral health services in the country. We manage literally thousands of uh, behavioral health experts and millions of patients. And, you know, we do that by taking our uh, technology and integrating it with data and insight um, at scale. And as Kevin said before, scale is pretty much been key to the success of this company from the beginning, but going after the big picture has been the strategic win over the last five to 10 years, particularly in the United States. We do operate internationally. Uh, we are in the country of Brazil in pretty big way. We have a large presence there. And we do consulting and services uh, at several countries around the world. Um, but as you can guess, uh, the United States you know, has a unique health system and is where our expertise is, is, is based. All right. So again, real quickly, and I promise we're almost done with the slide where we'll get on to some of the cool stuff. Um, just to kind of show you where we fit within our organization from an open source program office perspective. I'm sure most of you have seen diagrams like this in, in the past. It just kind of shows how we deal with policy and process. We deal with legal requirements, security requirements. Um, and then we also give back to the open source community. Um, we're working hard to, to ramp that up. Uh, as we speak, we've got a big op upstream engineering program that, that's gotten started this year. But today, specifically, what we're going to talk about is this top box up here on the right about how we do our open source uh, consumption governance and tools we use to get that done. Um, again, at our scale and at the volume we have to deal with. And we're also going to talk about uh, how we do our upstream engineering, the governance around uh, contributing back to open source and some of the tools we've done. And Hopefully what you'll find really useful out of this and what you can share is that all the tools we're going to show you today, we have open source, we have released to um, our public Optum uh, organization on GitHub. And so therefore you can test them out, try them out, open issues, you can tell us where we did it right or wrong, and you can help us make them better. So we're going to, we're going to show you stuff and then we're going to share the code with you and hopefully we can all do a better job at this sort of thing. All right. Randy's going to talk to you about the engineering. You know, what do we have to do for that? Yeah, so there's a lot of statements on this slide that are um, descriptive of what an engineer might think about open source, starting with, you know, why is this important? A lot of times uh, we find that engineers are not aware of some of the rules or uh, importance around open source in terms of being compliant with the, uh, the obligations and the license. So, we, you know, we start off with the why and we try to answer the why and then they ask why and they do usually five rounds of why before you get everything across. Um, we found a while ago we were using uh, another product in the marketplace uh, that seemed like everybody else was using uh, but it did not uh, it, it did not make sense after a while because it wasn't scratching the itch that we had which was our our scale and automation. We wanted something that would be uh, frictionless for the developers to use, or at least very low friction, and that to increase adoption. Because uh, as a large company, we have had a lot of tools be purchased over the years, and then find them sitting on the shelf or ignored after six months to a year because they were just too darn hard. You know, people don't have to do that. Um, so our our, our use case uh, brought in. Uh, we wanted open source licensing and vulnerability analysis and management. Uh, had to be something the users could use themselves. And um, we wanted it to be API driven so people could integrate it into their processes uh, in, in new and innovative ways. Again, extremely high volume. We have thousands of projects that we want to analyze. And um, we had to get it uh, in there with, uh, without much impact. The vast majority of this, this last statement on the slide about our software, we do sell software on the open market, uh, but what, most of what we're doing in our development world is for internal use, uh, where we, we use it uh, to, to manage people's workflows during the day or to manage portals for, in, uh, for 
customers to come to on the internet. Uh, and we have, you know, fairly high number of concurrent users in those portals. So it's important for things to scale. All right. So now we'll, we'll move away from the, the safety of uh, PowerPoint slides and, and we'll actually show you some things. Um, we developed a tool called Barista and there's just some um, logos up here of all the different technologies and the technology stack that we use to, to put it together. But what I'm going to do now is move us over to uh, a live demo. This is an Azure hosted instance of our tool. Um, it's public, so there's there's nothing in here that's that's uh, um, a problem for us to show you. Um, I've already logged into it. We'll try to show you different pieces um, as we go through today. But the idea is we want to show you how this is important to different groups within our organization. So Randy was just talking about what the engineering community needs. And so we're going to take a look at that first. And I think, um, Randy, we were going to talk about, use the, the WebGoat project as an example. So I'll go ahead and bring that up and you can kind of yeah. talk about what's here. So what we, we like to see is something that's visually appealing. So we put a little work uh, into some good good libraries. But the, the, the big thing here is to give an at-a-glance view of the state of your of your application. Um, the way Barista works is the end user would uh, give us their GitHub location and then some processes run in the background. Here, here's our detail slide that that this is what the user would enter to get their custom their, their project into the into the system. Anyway, they would in, instigate a, sta a scan. Can you go back to the overview real quick and sure. let's just go over this the pie charts. A scan would run and it would end up showing them what what kind of license they use and what kind of security holes they have. We're using open source processes or projects to perform those two tasks behind the scenes. Um, but uh, the, the data from those projects was not easily consumable, we found. And the reason we built a portal around it was to, to make it something that would, would drive utilization. If we just gave people a bunch of scripts and said, go run these on your project, some might do it, but the data would just be fragmented all over the organization. This gives us the ability to easily scan projects at scale and store the data in a way that's easily retrievable and that we can run analytics and reports against. If you wanna click on the scans tab, we'll show a scan real quick. Sure. So this is where the, the user would initiate a scan and they hit the plus scan button. We don't need to do it right now, but uh, when they click on a scan, it will show the results of that in terms of licenses and security. So here's an example of all the licenses that are used in this WebGoat project. And the takeaway message is people are often surprised at how many licenses fall on, on their project. They, they, hadn't, they never knew, they never even bothered to look. In most cases, they just figured it was okay to use all this stuff. And in most cases it is, but it's important. Uh, it's becoming more and more important, especially if you're uh, distributing software or making uh, deals, customers are asking for proof that you understand your licenses and your obligations and that you're meeting them so that they don't end up getting encumbered with um, a legal battle sometime in the future. So like uh, in this particular, product, we're seeing the Eclipse, we're seeing GNU, we're seeing Apache, we're seeing MIT, you know, each one of those has its own obligations that you need to follow. Um, and luckily, it's a lot of overlap. So it's not um, impossible. But we needed something that would aggregate that together into one list, which if you go back to the top, you can click on our obligations tab. And, sure. Uh, well, let's, I'm sorry. Look, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to mention um, again, from an engineering perspective, the one thing that Barista does that I think a lot of um, even vendor tools doesn't do is uh, we not only look at your primary project uh, dependency manifest, we actually go and dig through your your primary dependencies, the dependencies of those, which are your secondary dependencies, your tertiary dependencies. We run all the way down the dependency tree. And as Randy said, a lot of folks are surprised when they look at their project and the bill of materials and realize that, hey, I'm only referencing, you know, a dozen primary dependencies, but those dozen primary dependencies, once you run down the dependency tree, can bring back hundreds or even thousands of secondary and tertiary dependencies. This example project, um, as you saw down there at the bottom, has something like 239 dependencies once you run down the tree. Right. Um, and, and that's, you know, it's very difficult for people to track that stuff manually without using some sort of a tool. And the other uh, thing we found 
that was a surprise was the um, acceptance by our community of the security results. So we we didn't plan on doing security scanning in Barista, but the tools we used, some of them did that as well, or there were tools that were easy to, to add. So we said, well, let's go ahead and add it and see if anybody looks at it. And as it turned out, that was a huge feature for teams um, because they'd been inundated with security tools by our centralized security team that weren't always either easy to use or they didn't always provide information that was actionable or useful. Where um, when they would run Baristo, the first thing I found was they would actually start if they saw security items, they would go deal with them and then they'd fix them or they'd ask us for advice on how do we go rescan this or how do we fix this? And it's like they cared. We were very surprised. It was it was a great thing. So um, what, what Brista does is it scans against the CVE database uh, and or from, from the NIST and then categorizes them, pulls the categories as high, low or critical and gives them a nice list of work to do and um, find that when you give developers a list, they're pretty good at turning that into projects and and ticking them off. And I was also going to mention too, we pull back all that data from the National Vulnerability Database. So the all the details are here. So they can even see, you know, what was the origin of these reported vulnerabilities. They can go back to the original reporting entities and how the National Institute for Science and Technology found out about them. So that can mm -hmm. be useful when they're trying to fix things. Yep. Uh, and that's scanning. So the uh, last thing we were going to, or not the last thing, but another thing we're going to talk about is a software bill of materials, or also known as an SBOM. And uh, this is useful for teams that want to have uh, a look at all the products, as Kevin was mentioned, when you follow the dependencies all the way down, um, this gives them a list that they can then refer to uh, when, they, when someone asks the question of, well, what modules are you using? In, in addition though, since this is a centralized data store, this is starting to build a repository for our enterprise of all the different open source software that we are relying on and using. So when it comes time for when someone says, hey, there's an impacted thing like uh, OpenSSL, who all is using that? We can easily go to the database and pull out a list of, of areas that we know are using it and may need to remediate something. Sure, and, and we can, we can show you that here. We've got our, our module search feature. Um, I, I'll, I'll look for something here that I know is in our sample database. So you can find um, occurrences of anything that refers to, to Apache Beans, for example. You can see that WebGo project we were looking at um, has it. If I click on it, it'll show me the exact module that I found. So you can, you can use it to do impact analysis. And again, from an engineering perspective, that's really valuable. And by the way, in the chat, in the, the Zoom chat, I put the, um, the URLs for Barista. Again, all this is open source. It's all out there. Um, anybody can get this set up and running, hopefully with a minimum of effort, if you want to try it out yourself. Yeah, to that, as if, if you're familiar with uh, Docker and Docker Compose, that's all it takes to run this. Uh, there's instructions at our GitHub for how to pull it off, but to get a basic instance running that will do scans and give you an uh, idea, uh, the, the ability to demonstrate it to people, uh, it's all there and very easy to do from either a small server or a cloud instance. Um, we run this uh, with Kubernetes or, or OpenShift in the background meaning we have it set to dynamically scale. If we find usage gets high, we haven't found it to be a problem yet where we need to just scale it too much, um, but it was built as an enterprise uh, level type of asset, uh, not as a bespoke workstation or um, you know, Snowflake implementation system. Cool. And so, this is our, we call this our NASCAR slide, right? Or I, yeah. I don't, but it's, got all of our vendors just wanted to point out that these are the products that we use to implement barista um, there are also higher level modules or scanning tools that are integrated that these tools helped us integrate so there are um, some other props we could give later sure and we'll jump back into the tool in a few minutes but again now we want to talk about it from another perspective so um as an attorney, I work with our in-house counsel all the time, um, because if, you, if you've tried to run an open source program office, you know that the groups that you have to keep happy are your in-house counsel, your engineering community, um, your procurement community, if you, if you have a big procurement office, 
um, as well as your security folks. And so we wanted today to kind of give you a pers our perspective from each of those uh, different personas. So from the, from the in-house counsel perspective, when they're thinking about open source, you know, they're thinking about how can we automate it? Again, 28,000 developers, 8,000 applications. This is not something that we're gonna hire an army of attorneys to look at. So we have to be able to set up automated rules to look at the results of those scans that Randy was talking about. Um, you know, training, contribution license agreements. Um, if your company does any merger and acquisition activity, how do you respond to due diligence questions or, or so forth? You know, how do you respond to RFPs from your customers? A lot of times customers nowadays as part of their vendor management will say, hey, show me how your product or service is using open source because I wanna make sure you don't introduce something into my environment that's going to cause an issue. So these are all things that, that we have to deal with. And again, Barista was an attempt to uh, have a self-service tool that was as automated as possible that could operate at volume. So again, let's just jump back over to uh, the, the tool and uh, we'll show you a couple other things that, for example, the, the attorneys might be interested in. So if I, if I jump back over to my, my projects and I'll, I'll go back over to, um, to our, my WebGoat project again, just because it's a good example. One of the things that's really helpful from a legal perspective is the ability to customize obligations in plain English uh, that anybody can understand. So essentially what we've done, and I've just got a few samples set up in this, this demo site, but in our internal site, we've gone through all the licenses um, that are being used and consumed. We've taken the licenses themselves. We've taken the um, obligations or the things that you are supposed to affirmatively do if you use software with that is licensed according to those open source licenses. Um, and we've laid them out here so that the project managers and the engineering community can understand without having to read a bunch of legalese as to what is required. It also gives uh, your organization, or in this case, our organization, an opportunity to word things um, that involve risk mitigation. You know, sometimes we even go beyond the license, right? We want to be center of the circle ethically. We want to respect copyrights uh, of anybody for third-party intellectual property that we're using. So because you can customize those obligations, you can associate them with different licenses. Once the scan is done, you can go to this tab and it'll lay out here, here are your obligations. For example, almost every open source license requires attribution of some sort. Um, it's worded lots of different ways and lots of different licenses, but we kind of distill it down to some of the basics, right? Um, we want to make sure that uh, for most licenses that we keep open source components isolated, right? We, this is sort of the copy and paste rule. In other words, you know, don't go to an open source component that you like, grab a function or some code and just copy and paste it into your own code, right? Instead, use it in a more appropriate modern software development fashion, which is, you know, make it a dependency, you know, make your, your function call, all those kinds of things. But all this can be, can be customized. Um, I'll pull up here one of the administration screens just to give you a, a feel. Um, so we can write rules based on the licenses and based on the use case. So our in-house counsel loves the fact that uh, and I apologize for covering over part of this. Maybe I can move that. There we go. Um, so for example, a lot of folks worry about um, AGPL licensing because it's incompatible with certain use cases. Um, so what we can do is um, we, can, um, we can associate um, rules that say, you know, for the AGPL license, um, if, you're if your use case is going to distribute that code, when you first set up that, your project to scan, you have to tell us how your, your project is going to be used. You know, is it internal? Um, is it going to be hosted as a website? Or are you going to distribute that software outside the company? And in this case, if it's, if it's an AGPL licensed open source component that you're going to use that we find when we scan your, your project, you know, we're going to throw up a big red flag and say, hey, if it's distributed, that's a problem, right? We need to stop and reevaluate and those kind of things. But our in-house counsel loves the ability to dynamically set up these, these rules, which is really helpful. Um, another thing they like, and again, I'll go back to our, our WebGoat project. 
Um, a new feature that we just added pretty recently to Barista is this attribution tab. Essentially what this does is it builds a downloadable file that has all of the copyright information and all of the license text that allows a, uh, a project manager or a project owner to comply with the attribution requirement. They can literally download this file, include it in the distribution of their software if it gets distributed. If it's a hosted piece of software that um, is um, you know, hosted in one of our data centers or in one of our cloud um, leased facilities, then um, they can include this as a, you know, a readme or a legal link in the, in the website. But this makes it really easy. The, the project manager, the technical folks don't have to go pull all this together. Barista pulls it all together as part of the scan. And if anybody's um, aware of Microsoft's project in the last year or so called clearlydefined.io, that's our source for all this information. And that way we're um, pretty assured that as thinking changes or as people discover new things about new components, it's going to stay up to date. So again, our legal folks are really happy that we can pull this sort of um, bill of materials package manifest attribution file together for them. All right, let's jump back over to our our next group here. Um, Randy, you want to talk a little bit about our, uh, what the procurement sure. folks are worried about? Yes. So for uh, for a long time, uh, our company and and many other companies uh, would not uh, allow open source software because they were worried about lawsuits. This is you know going back 15 years. Uh, thanks to Kevin's work and a few others that has largely been eradicated and now using open source as a strategy. But our vendors, uh, or I'm sorry, our, our procurement experts, our purchasing team, they still want to do diligence as we bring in new um, software to make sure that we're using it, even if it is open source and free as in free beer open source. So we uh, also built in functionality in the tool to allow uh, people that essentially do that diligence on software to enter in uh, projects, just like everything else, that uh, will record the licensing for anything that is being distributed. This particularly hits our desktop software, where we have um, uh, packages that are more uh, individual usage based. It's not so much about libraries, but they want to make sure that they've at least recorded it. The, the obligations are really the same, though, and the, um, uh, the warranty clauses uh, in open source, often we want to make sure that we're uh, we're aware of what those are and or, or are not in most cases. Um, we also have a um, a place where a vendor was building something custom for us, and we wanted to know what are the rules for that open source framework. So we were able to help the vendor figure out what their obligations were and catch it before it went off the off the rails because when you're having a third party build things for you, um, you often don't have control. All right, I wanna do a little bit of a time check because we've only got about 15 minutes left. So um, I wanna make sure to get to everything. Um, one of the last groups that everybody's always concerned about is you know, what does executive leadership think? What are they worried about? They're often real excited about saving money when you're using open source software but you know, they wanna know what about exposure to vulnerabilities, which we've already talked about and how Barista helps us with that. They, they wanna know about software builds and materials and those kind of things. Can we govern this at scale? Again, we talked about the, the whole purpose and the structure of Barista is that it's self-service. So there is no central choke point. Um, the, the software itself is rules driven and based on the scans, we give engineers answers. The one feature in Barista we haven't shown you that our executives do like because it gives them a high level overview. Um, and let me jump back over here to the tool um, is something that we put in place this summer. Um, Randy, if you wanna talk about this just a second. Yeah, I mean, this was uh, again, having the data centralized in a large data store gives us the ability to do some analytics so we can make pretty charts. But we basically, wanted to know uh, from a metrics point of view, are we getting better or are we getting worse? So they can get a quick glance, come in and find out how vulnerable are we? How many of our projects have high vulnerabilities? So we were able to do a quick compute with a simple SQL query and put that on the front page. We can also show what our vulnerabilities are. That's the, the, the chart below. And um, 
also give some aggregate counts of, of where, what kind of licenses we're using, which turned out to be a surprise to most people. They, didn't re they would have probably thought GPL was our number one license, but MIT by far is our number one license. Uh, if you go back to the top real quick, Kevin, I wanted to also point out that as a user, you can look at it from your own data or you can look at it at an organize, organization wide which is really scanning the entire database in this example instance there's not um, enough data to really show difference between those two but in our internal internally deployed version of this we have hundreds of, of projects and uh, you can you know as a user you can come in and find what do i have a problem am i am i worse than the organization am i better than the organization do i have some work to fix so this has turned out to be pretty popular all right thanks randy um so um, we've been talking a lot about our barista tool that we put out there. Again, it's open source. It's out there. Please go out and take a look at it. You know, watch what we're doing, ask questions and the issues, download it, deploy it. Um, see if you can break it. Tell us what we can do to make it better. Um, we really would like to build a community around barista and um, it's something we put out there um, to share with everyone. Um, I promise at the beginning, we talk about our, our upstream engineering program. So this is kind of the opposite of, of what barista is designed for. Um, this is our concept of how we govern giving software back to the open source community. Um, we call it upstream engineering. We didn't create that name. Uh, I think I'm sure I grabbed it from the to-do group at the Linux Foundation or, or something like that. But I want to talk real briefly about sort of how our process works, and then I'll show you um, the results of the tools that we use to, to track this. So in our case, we've got corporate policies, of course, you know, we're a public company, everything has to be done by policy. The policy says it's allowed to, get, to contribute back to open source as long as you follow certain rules and processes, okay? We came up with those rules. The rules have to do with certain kinds of reviews that are required. You're required to have sponsorship by a leader in the organization, someone who would know if it's a good thing from a business perspective to, uh, for us to contribute back to a particular project. Um, so we require leadership sponsorship. Um, we require technical reviews, peer reviews, uh, to make sure that the code that we're putting out there is good code. Um, we require security reviews. Um, we obviously don't want to put any code out there uh, into the world, into the open source ecosystem that causes a problem for folks. So um, you have to get a security review of any um, pull request or contribution that you're going to put out there. All that's covered in a class. By the way, we use an automatic, uh, an automated uh, learning management system to do that. I'm sure most people do, you know, something like Moodle or whatever to, to put your class together. Um, so everybody has to take that before they can be an approved upstream engineer. Um, uh, that happens. And then we use a process where, again, our, our corporate um, approach is, is self-service. So we created a, a GitHub repo internally. We have an enterprise GitHub installation internally. And there's really only two required files for this files in this repo. One is a markdown file of um, the list of open source communities that have been approved for contribution. Again, based on those leadership reviews, I do a legal review of it to make sure they have licenses and um, contribution policies that are acceptable. So there's one list of approved communities, and then there's one list of approved contributors, you know, the people that have taken that class and agreed to follow the rules, okay? And then with those two simple files in our, our, uh, our GitHub repo internally, any engineer in the company, any of those 28,000 people can go out to that repo, they can do a pull request against um, both of those files to add a new um, uh, approved community or to, to add themselves to the list of approved contributors if they've taken the class. And from there, we've got an automated um, API that runs that we host, that we created, um, that reads from those files every day. It goes and checks all of the people against all of the approved places out on GitHub to see what they've actually done. And that way we can track all of the code that we put out in the world. Um, and that's the automated part that we're going to share with you. We've open sourced that. So um, I just have a slide here that shows a sample of our internal, um, our, our internal repo. There's an example of both of those files I was talking about. The one on the left is the markdown file where we ask you to, to um, tell us the information we need to review for any given community that we're going to contribute to. And that's true whether it's a public community that we have nothing to do with 
or if it's a community that, that Optum or United Health Group has published ourselves and sponsored. And then over on the right is a simple text file of the public identity, the public GitHub identity of our people that want to be approved to contribute. So it's really that simple. Let me just jump in. Um, sure. If any of you out there are wondering, you know, why are we bothering with all this? The title of the talk was open source on purpose. And it, what we have realized is that um, if you let this go without any kind of understanding or control, it's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle. If your employees are out and they just start randomly contributing under your name, the company could be at, at great risk or just wouldn't even know where all the company's contributions live. So this process is put in place in order to help us track and uh, be aware of the enterprise's contributions to the open source community. All right. So real quickly, again, this is supposed to be a case study, a, a demo talk. So again, here is our live GitHub um, uh, community that, that we share for, for everybody to see. Um, I'll, there's a GitHub link right up here where you can go get the code for this site. This is a DocuSource site. So you can take our site and, and modify it and, and use it for your organization if you like. Um, but what happens with that API that runs every night that we just got through talking about is that it produces two files and those files are JSON files and they're automatically checked into our public project every night. And this is how we share with the world all the work we're doing. So um, this is our public community contributions file. So you can see these are all of the communities that we have contributed code to. Um, and you can see some projects are approved but don't yet have uh, contributions. Other projects are approved and have contributions. So you can see Eric has done two pull requests to this particular um, open source project. Um, you know, there's Elasticsearch you might you might recognize or, doc or the actual DocuSource site. But there's over, there's over 100 of these. I think the last count was somewhere in the 130 range of projects that we've approved for open source contribution. And then of course, all the links here, you can actually drill down and see Amy's specific um, contribution if you want, if you wanna see what that, what that is. Um, and these are just listed in alphabetical order. So if you scroll down a little bit further, you can start to see all of the Optum projects that we have um, published. And there's Optum Barista, you know, the tool we were talking about. And you can see all the people, um, several of these people are internal, folks. So, you know, there's me and, and there's one of my teammates, Ben, and there's Randy, who's been helping me with this presentation. But then there's some other people here who were either students or outside contributors that have helped us make Barista better. And again, the API builds and pulls all this stuff for you. Um, so hopefully maybe you can make use of that. The other um, interesting page in our uh, open source site is our engineering page. So these are all the people and it just kind of looks at this data from a different perspective. Um, so this list lists all the people and all the different projects they've given to. So all of these are upstream engineers within Optum or UHG. We pull their public profiles, the API does all that. Um, and it builds this cool little, little um, page dynamically. And you can see the, the projects that people contributed to. So Pradeep over here is given, you know, 83 pull requests um, to this particular Optum project. Um, and then you've got Amy down here that I called out before. She's one of our most prolific open source folks. And, you know, the box that it builds for her is so long, I have to scroll several pages just to get just to get down to it. And then if you see somebody without any contributions, it just means they've taken the class and they've been approved, but they haven't um, done any contributions yet. So this is our way of kind of recognizing our people and, and sharing with the world the public work we're doing. Um, I wanted to point out and I'll pull it over here and share with you. So um, if you go to our, our, our GitHub um, organization for Optum, um, you know, there's the link that takes you directly to that site I was just showing you. Um, and then here is the GitHub repository for that site. So um, again, if you wanna play with this API, if you want to take it and use it, um, help us make it better, um, you know, submit issues or whatnot, it's all out here, it's all open source. Um, you're welcome to, to do that. And we encourage you to do that, right? We wanna make this, easier for, for other folks as well. So um, I think we're down to like the last five minutes. Um, we've got a couple other things we can talk about, but I wanna make sure we leave some time for, for questions. Um, if anybody's got any questions, if you wanna enter them in the, the Q&A tool or, or in the chat, 
Um, Randy and I will be glad to, to try to answer those. Yeah. Any questions about deploying it or trying it out? We'd really love it. People tried it and gave us some feedback. It's uh, like we said before, available at GitHub. Go pull the code, fire up some Docker images and you're off and running. I will also add, uh, since there's no questions yet, um, we had to put in capability for the process or the project to handle both internal GitHub repositories and public GitHub repositories. So it does manage to have credentials to both and it's um, able to work across those boundaries, uh, which was not trivial, but turned out as an enterprise that was pretty necessary because we have components that are in the public sphere and we have things that we've built internally that are in our internal GitHub. Uh, so Kevin asks, um, do you know how Barista compares to the OSS Review Toolkit? Um, yeah, so th actually that's a great question, Kevin, because I've uh, I I've evaluated that and I've been on some of the calls. I'm, I'm actually part of the Linux Foundation um, tooling group um, that, that worked on ORT and, and the folks primarily over in Germany that, that put ORT together. And, and, and that's a great question, and, and here's why. Um, as we mentioned in the beginning, we're primarily an internal organization that is that needs to be able to do things at high volume and in a self-service manner, right? So if I've got a project manager in Ireland that's working on a big project, um, he's only got so much time to devote to open source governance, right? And so we needed to make it as simple as possible for him. And we believe Barista lets that happen. Um, ORT is a great tool. You know, I've done a lot of, of testing with it and some other kinds of things. ORT is much more designed for someone who's shipping software and has to be very particular about complying with all the rules um, for shipping software. Let's say they're shipping um, a, a Linux type component. Maybe they're shipping it with a device. Maybe they're shipping it as part of an automobile manufacturing um, um, type application. Um, and, and the reason I say that they're different is ORT is very detailed is that in our experience, when you go through and develop uh, a scan in ORT and set it all set it all up, and you and if you're familiar with it, you know they've got this concept of curations and other kinds of things. Um, it can take a week or better to get a scan for a relatively complex application working. Right, that's a lot of time to devote um, to get it up and running. And it's not because ORT is not a good tool; it's a great tool. It's just that it approaches things differently with how it pulls code. And um, there's lots of ways for things to go wrong. And so um, our engineers for our internal uses, they're just not going to devote that kind of time to it. The other issue is that ORT isn't really designed to collate all the information it finds into a central database or into a central repository. I imagine you could do it if you were willing to, to figure out a way to deploy it that way. But that's by default, that's not how it's set up to work. It's more set up to be a distributed effort where a particular project team scans their code. So it, it just two different approaches to the same problem. You know, I would suggest that if you're shipping software um, to customers, especially in countries like the European in European Union, where there's some very stringent intellectual property rules, um, and you can devote a large amount of time to getting it exactly right, ORT may be the way to go. Barista is really good when you're primarily concerned with all this software that we're pulling into our organization that we're using for internal projects to make sure that we're recognizing copyright holders uh, rights um, and we're not making any big mistakes. Um, it's a much more self-service kind of approach. It's much quicker to get up and running for any given project team. Now, I hope that answers your question. I can talk at length about the differences, but that's a great, great question. And let's see, I think we got one, one, one minute left. I hope some of this is, has been helpful to folks. Um, again, please share with folks because, uh, you know, just selfishly, we'd like to get more people involved with any of these projects, whether it's our contribution API, uh, Barista. Um, we would really like to, to have folks contribute, help us make it better.